And joining us now is Brian Claypool, a civil rights litigator and a criminal defense attorney. Good to have you. Let's first talk about the wife. I mean, we're learning more details about her and how uh, she was texting with her husband. She had cased out these locations with, with him. Uh, she had heard him talk about for months, allegedly, that he wanted to carry out some kind of jihadist attack. You put two and two together. Do you think that she was truly in the dark? Well, I don't think she was truly in the dark, but the big question is, can she be legally culpable right. for the crimes that he committed? She's not in the dark, but I don't think you have enough evidence right now to show that she had actual knowledge that there was an impending mass terror that was going to be carried out by her husband and that she concealed that from law enforcement. So because you had this charge of misprison, which sounds kind of odd, but it basically is the deliberate concealment of knowledge of a crime. Is that a fairly high bar then to prove? Is that what you're saying? It's a very high bar to prove because first of all, you have to prove that she had actual knowledge of the impending massacre, Pulse nightclub. The, the, the evidence shows that, that uh, Mateen actually made a phone call during the massacre in which he was calling his wife saying, hey, I'm the killer. Right. Now, if I'm defending her, I'm gonna argue, wait a minute, that suggests that she didn't know at that moment that he was the killer. So suspicion is not the same as knowledge because again, I mean, she saw him purchase, I think, a, a lot of uh, weapons and ammunition. And, you know, you again, you add all of this up, what he's doing, and he's telling her he has these intentions. That's not strong enough. That's that, not a threshold. That is not enough. That's not enough. If she had driven him to Pulse nightclub mm -hmm. on the then, night of the shooting, on the yeah. night of the shooting, right. then That's she would be indicted. Aiding and abetting, right? That's aiding yeah. and abetting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Then she could be indicted for that. Mm -hmm. But encouraging, even encouraging. Let's say she encouraged him to do do something. Encouraging is not enough either. You have to have actual knowledge of the that the point in time in which this crime is going to be carried out, and it's going to be carried out by him. Okay. So, so you talking from a defense attorney point of view? Could she argue that she was abused? She was controlled by her husband. He has a history of abusing his first wife, apparently. Could she invoke spousal privilege? In well, that's a, that's a great point because what if there is evidence that, and, and there actually is evidence that yeah. he has been a violent man in the past. So she can argue that she's a, the battered woman syndrome, that she's been abused by him, or she's fearful of her life such that she does not want to go to law enforcement and report the impending crime because he might kill her. So when we talk about how to prevent something like this from ever happening again, you've been saying that there should be a law out there that will mandate family members or friends or neighbors to report suspicious behavior. But uh, I guess, you know, at what point should someone report suspicious behavior if this were a law? I mean, you know, th there's that fine line. Well, look, a, a good starting point is, is approaching and attacking terror from the inside, because a lot of these mass murders in the United States it hasn't been done by a lone person. Other people have known about it. The Boston bomber, even even the, the Sandy Hook shooting in Newtown. Yeah, his mom knew. The mom, suspected. exactly. Yeah. And, and even an Aurora, he had a psychologist yeah. who knew. So if you can create a legal duty from the inside pushing upward, that if somebody has a reasonable suspicion, it doesn't have to be an absolute knowledge that they know this is going to happen, but if they've got a reasonable suspicion and you create a legal duty to report it, if you don't then report it, you face criminal prosecution and potential imprisonment. Without that, everybody's just gonna turn a cheek and continue to not report it. Okay, let's talk about the gun laws because there's now uh, a move to essentially deny someone on the terror watch list the ability to purchase a gun. Gun rights advocates say this is completely and totally unjust. A gun is a legal item, you can buy it, the right to it is on the Constitution. You put someone on the terror watch list, you are denying their constitutional rights. They are in a position where they are already declared guilty and you have to prove yourself innocent. What's the counter argument? Well, I'm actually a civil rights litigator right. and I'm actually on the side of that. Right. I, I think at some point it's gotta be a balancing test, John. You've gotta weigh protecting our citizens of the United States versus civil rights and constitutional rights. And I think the bill that Dianne Feinstein, Senator from California, yeah is proposing next week to be voted on is, is very fair. And what's that, what that says is that if you're on the terror watch list, the U.S. attorney can come in, and even if you're not on the list, now, now the bill next week is gonna say if you've been investigated by the FBI, you could still be not denied a gun, but then you'd be given an opportunity to have what's called an administrative hearing or a court hearing to determine whether that has violated your due process. But I think, I think public safety right now trumps 
constitutional rights. Well, the NRA has been very vocal on this. They're opposed to these and kinds of bills. We know <laughs> that uh, we know who has the power. It's not really the electorate. It's the NRA who Absolutely spends right. lots of money when it comes to lawmakers. We appreciate uh, you joining us for Brian, the conversation. Thanks for coming in. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. the insight.